two different locations. Some things almost exactly the same, other things have changed. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I was telling you that shot was the first thing that I wrote, the slow motion into full speed. You know, never was it the way that I'd imagined. Um, because, you know, the lenses that I have couldn't get in as close as I'd wanted or as slow as I wanted. Or, but the difference is, with HD, I shot, you know, the whole, uh, that whole shot in slow motion. And so I went into post-production and the moment the shot pulls back, I just removed every sort of one, you know, every two frames of every three or whatever it was, so it played full speed. The problem is when I was doing it on the film camera, uh, because you also have to do an aperture change as you do a speed change, we literally had about four of us on the camera at the same time. And it was a case of now, now, you know, because we were all doing, you know, one was doing the, the zoom, the other doing the aperture, the other doing the speed, and, and the other doing the focus. Um, so, you know, we're in a new world now of opportunity with, with, with some of those technical things. But the other thing is that promo, I, I spent about six and a half days filming nine minutes, whereas I was averaging uh, shooting 30 minutes in six days in the feature version. So, you know, the ability to be able to compose things, you know, versus, uh, you know, kind of gun and run, the run and gun. Um, with the uh, with the feature, um, now something I was also suggesting to people the other day was, uh, you know, in film they say a lot of things like your crew should be this size, you should structure schedule like that, and all these other things. My bottom line is that you dictate it for yourself. What do you know you need? What do you know is practical to you? Um, you know, I've shot films where. Uh, you know, the film Frog I was mentioning, The Dark Fairy Tale, where we shot in three separate blocks and had a month in between each where we would redesign, reset. And it was a, a wonderful way to shoot. And it was an economical way to shoot. Didn't mean anything to our budget. Um, and that's the thing. I think dictate to yourselves how you want these things to be done. You know, there, there might be something you're shooting where, you know, half of it is of a reasonable scale and you need a full crew and then the other half you know, you can just shoot with your own camera and the actors, and, and be bold enough to dictate these things if you can, um, because it can really free you up and make a big difference, but also for the enjoyment of the experience, because, you know, sometimes when you just throw yourself into an intense three weeks, by the time you get to the end, uh, you just want it to be over, and, you know, you'd rather have a bit more sort of presence of mind as you're, as you're going through it. Um, so, any more questions at this stage? Yes? Um, how come you changed the location? I mean, you were going to do it in Scotland, right? Yeah. And why did you do it in the States? Uh, 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 one, I didn't want to shoot another movie in Scotland. I'd done three there by that point. When I, th this was, the promo you just saw, that would have been my second feature um, when it was being set up then. And by the time I returned to it, I'd already finished my third. And by that time, I'd been going out to reservation there for a while, shooting some documentary stuff. And I really wanted to shoot something there, and I thought the story fit. Um, so I made the switch. And actually, economically, it turned out to be a lot cheaper as well. And, you know, I mean, for an actor, uh, for me to pay an actor for a day in the States, uh, Screen Actors Guild minimums for an ultra-low budget film is $110 a day if they have an agent. It's $100 a day if they don't have an agent. In the UK, it would be somewhere like four hundred dollars a day. So, you know, that in itself. I mean, that's that was my one of my biggest expenses. You know, um, it, my uh, accommodation uh, at the motel we were staying in averaged out at about fifteen dollars per room a night. Now I'm not finding that in Cancun. I mean. Um, <laughs> And this was in Nebraska, which is a very inexpensive part of the States. Um, so it actually worked out. I mean, I came in about 25, 30% under budget, which when you barely got a budget is good going. But uh, you know, when you're somewhere where it's, it's hard to spend money, it, it, it's, you know, I'm happy about that. <laughs> you know, especially because it was ultimately coming out of my pocket. But um, so. So yeah, any other questions? Yeah. What are you doing here in Cancun? What do you expect about the location of Cancun? Uh, 
for uh, making a movie for you? Well, I, I came for the film festival because this screened uh, last Thursday night. Not that, I mean, I've, as I say, four times the audience here, but uh, <laughs> last, you know, because on the day they decided to change it from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. without really telling anyone. It's, uh, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little detail. <laughs> it's a little detail. Um, but, um, yeah, so, and, and because I'm here, I'm, uh, I've been on the road for the last sort of 15, 18 months with film festivals and with other things. Um, I was Toronto before here, Bangkok before that, Abu Dhabi before that, South Dakota before that. Um, and, you know, now I'm here for two or three weeks or however long until I get bored. So anyone, anyone who wants to hang out while I'm here, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for things to do. So, and, and I'm on all the social networking sites. So type in Stephen Lewis Simpson and you'll find me. I'm, I'm easy to reach. And, and, um, but yeah, and I'm looking for entertainment. So, um, but no, I mean, the, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's kind of curious place. You know, it's just, you know the whole strip of hotels is like nowhere I've ever seen, you know, it's like, but I haven't explored enough yet, so, so yeah, but, you know, Razgong could have been shot here, he could shoot it anywhere, yeah. I mean, that's, but that's the thing, I mean, that's, that's what, you know, when you're looking at a story, it's like, where would, where would it work, where might it be interesting or different, or, I mean, when I've been marketing this film, uh, you know, there was something like four and a half thousand features supposedly submitted to Sundance, this last year. Um, now, as an independent film, how are you supposed to compete with that in the marketplace? I mean, how is, I mean, how many films in a year do you think you hear of? And you're people that are interested. You maybe hear of 100, 75, something like that. So where do all these other ones fall away to? And, and, and how do you find an audience with it? Well, for me, the main way I've been marketing it so far has been, you know, to the audience interested in American Indian countries, stories, whatever else. Uh, because then I'm one of only two or three films a year set in that world. And, and that's the way that it's going to go. An independent film, uh, you know, sometimes it might even be a subtle change. You might just look at it in a script and just go, well, suddenly I'd be opening myself to a kind of special interest market that, um, you know, would, would suddenly seek you out rather than the other way around. And you do get films like that. I mean, um, and, and that's, I, I think that's the holy grail for independent cinema, is where the audience are coming to you, where you just have to have a, you know, even if you have a small online presence, if, you know, people sort of type into Google, American Indian movie, they hear about Razbaum on the list, suddenly it's present to them. And similarly, was, you know, a, there, there are other things out there for that. Um, and that's what we have to start developing more and more and more. Um, you know, I mean, I, I suspect I've probably, in terms of retail sales, probably 50% of them have come via Twitter, MySpace, Facebook, probably. I don't know for sure, but you know, that's where a large part of our marketing's uh, been from. But the, the other thing is that I've been selling to special interest distributors because there are, are there are, I mean, wholesalers. There are wholesalers that just handle American Indian, you know, movies and music. And they have their retailers set. So I think I think it's one of the things when you're looking at a story is, you know, even if it's, you know, you have a character and he has an occupation, could be anything, you know. But how can you spin it in that you might suddenly tap into something, um, or even sponsorship or things that might work for your marketing later down the line? Because and I know it's sort of one of these things that it's sort of real kind of boring thing to talk about in script stage, but when you put all this effort into a movie and you're trying to get it out to an audience, suddenly it's going to seem incredibly, you know, potent and, and, and relevant at that point. And um, the bottom line in this business is the easiest way to make your second movie is make money on your first. Um, you know, unless you're, uh, you know, in a country like France with, you know, a great infrastructure in terms of cultural funding and whatever else. So anyway, yeah, build up social networks. Mm -hmm. um, and other questions? Who was it that was chatting to me earlier saying you had so many questions? There you go. All right, now's your chance.
Um, you're on the spot. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is there's two, two people that got me to pick up a camera, uh, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. No, when I was about 15, 16, uh, I started doing martial arts. And I had this friend who would come around on a Sunday and we'd go to the video store and rent these movies and watch them. And then we'd fight, fight, fight. And then it got to the point of wanting to shoot my own ones, choreograph my own stuff. So I got a camera and started choreographing things. And the first things I ever shot were like martial arts movies. And then I, I started getting more into cinema, um, you know, watching Kurosawa, people like that, and started getting to realize the um, other elements to it. And, um, and then, you know, out of nowhere, I got this idea for a very, very powerful drama story, which I wrote, which became my first movie, which is a very, very depressing drama, but the exact opposite of, you know, a kickboxing movie. And, um, you know, but it was that funny route in, and that was what got me picking up the camera in the first place. And then, uh, you know, wrote and shot some things while I was a stockbroker, did it in my spare time. And then I left that, went to Los Angeles, interned for Roger Corman's studio, came back, shot my first feature, and then sort of wrote and developed things from there. Um, and then, you know, shot my other films from there. And it's, you know, it's taken, you know it takes a lot of time. And there's the other thing about the independent route. I mean, it's, it's a very, very slow process. I mean, Resbomb premiered about 15 months ago at the Montreal Film Festival, uh, which is one of the premier North American uh, film festivals, um, but it's now three years ago that I shot it. it. Took about a year, you know, a year and a quarter, year and a half to complete post production, and then a while to set up the first festival and things like that. So you know, you live with it for a long time. That's not including the preparation time. Um, you know, especially when you you do most of it yourself. I mean, it's you know, like you know, today I was you know been dealing with wholesale orders and um, you know and it's just continuing to promote it and get it out there um, I mean that's the one nice thing about doing it in this sort of studio system even though you might not have much creative control when it's done you know there are experts to take it over and handle it and you never have to worry about these things um, whether you like how they deal with it or not it's another matter all right yeah what is the meaning of res resbomb Resbomb is a reservation sort of slang term. Uh, firstly, it means uh, a resbomb is a reservation car, which is normally like 20 years old, falling to pieces, and they just manage to keep running forever uh, out of necessity and ingenuity. Um, but also, you can take it in slang terms and turn it in terms of bomb being a positive. Saying that girl, she's the bomb, she's the res bomb, she's the really hot girl from the reservation. But also, bomb is in the negative. You can say, you know, life is the res, you know, the res is it's the bomb, it's awful on the res. You know, so you can flip it a number of ways. But anyone over 35, 40 thinks it sounds terrible. Res, res, what's that? But anyway, I don't know. You know, I'm sure if I had a marketing department, they'd have forced me to change it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Is it going to be in theaters here in Mexico? No. No? Unless something miraculous happens. That's not <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing, I mean, people talk to me, you know, when's it going to be in theaters or whatever. To be honest, I'm not even, I've, I've not approached a single company about it because I know it's not going to happen. Because, again, out of the four and a half thousand films that were at Sundance, you know, even, I mean, they were submitted, and about 30 odd of those were selected, and maybe, and so few of them actually got into the theaters, and you're lucky if one of them made money when it was there. And, and so, and they're the ones that were selected. And so, it's a great way of losing money, uh, is getting a theatrical release. Um, and it also, I think, people view this as an independent movie, uh, but it's not an art house cinema film in a way. It's, it, you know, it's just a young person's movie, but no one would market it to them. I mean, it's, it's almost like the people who like Trent Ford's How to Deal four years ago 
were four years old and they're a bit more grown up, and they probably enjoy this. But nobody would market it to them that way because it's a different set of companies doing it. And you know, How to Deal is a $17 million movie. And you know, so it, 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 it's hitting things not quite in the, the right way, I think. Um, so, you know, I mean, I mean, obsessing about a theatrical release is, is, is a surefire way to be disappointed in, in independent circles. Just be prepared to be sur presently surprised rather than the other way around. And are you going to bring it to the movie in DVD? So yeah, it was released in the States in the summer on DVD. And I have some in the back if anyone wants to buy them. <laughs> Three hours and 45 minutes of extra features. There's a, a director's commentary if you're not bored of my voice already. This is only one screen of them. Um, and, um, but it's, you know, it, it's sort of that thing of trying to distinguish it. And I, I know that a lot of my audience are interest, is interested in American Indian culture, so, you know, put things in there, extra features about that world and whatever else that, you know, might interest them in, in, in buying it. Um, but it's also been a, a case of direct distribution because I've known you know, how to, you know, where to market it. I mean, I've been, I've been selling the film to places that don't buy, uh, that don't sell DVDs, you know, on reservations, things like that. Um, I have one gas station in, in the res, in the, on the reservation that in three months sold as many DVDs as Netflix would probably buy for the whole United States. And Netflix is seen as one of the big deals for an independent film, but it isn't really. And so, you know, that's the question. What's, you know, how do you redefine your own sort of distribution model? Um, now, if I got a distributor, they would sell a lot more units because they have mechanisms set up. But I would see very little of it. You know, right now, through a traditional distribution mechanism, I might see a dollar a unit or something like that in real terms once expenses and all those other things are taken off. I mean, at the moment in the US, I've typically been averaging somewhere between 15 and $17 for every DVD I sell. So I only need to sell 8% of what they would sell for me to make as much, but to make it now, not when they choose to pay me. You know, I was in Toronto last week and I just finally came to a settlement with a sales agent on a previous film of mine that it's taken me five years of legal hassles to get them to do what they were supposed to do in the first place. And so, you know, I mean, that's the other side, is, is the, the structure of the business is pretty much designed to screw producers. I mean, I was thinking about this today, a distribution deal, when they sell their film, first thing that happens is the distribution expenses are taken off before revenue is split. And you think, well, hold on a second. How much money have you spent on the film? Why are they getting to take their expenses off, but you're not getting to take anything off for the budget of the film? I mean, it's, and yet you outlay the money first, and you take the biggest risk, and all these other things. So, you know, we're heading towards a new business model there, and, you know, potentially one that if you, be, I mean, if you think about it, if Quentin Tarantino, rich as he is, went out and made a film for $5 million tomorrow with his own money, and he, streamed it online for people to watch for three dollars. Now, how many people would watch it in the first week in the world? One, two, three million, four million? He's suddenly in a, a nice profit. Now, he still wanted in theaters, which is a different issue, but you know, if when you're a marquee director like that, you suddenly have now got into a whole new you know, ball game in terms of Radiohead being able to distribute their album in a different way or whatever because they're Radiohead. So we're, we're going to start to see some interesting things coming about, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I pray. <laughs> Last question. Make it a good one. I'm not going to put you on the spot or anything, but make it a good one. <laughs> oh, come on. One more. And are you planning on doing a new movie? Uh, what kind of movie? Well, I, I, have, a, I have a slate of uh, scripts, and it's a question of which gets financed. Um, you know, I have a few scripts being looked at by a couple of um, major companies in LA who've made some of you know, the biggest movies over the last 20 years. Uh, 
you know, the biggest one would probably be about a $150 million budget. Now the odds are it'll never get made because even if someone buys it, the odds are it won't get made. Um, and there's a few of those projects out there, but at the end of the day, for me, it's getting the balance between the speculation within the system of what might get made, what might actually happen, versus being able to actually be sane and actually make a film. So for me, it's always this balance between uh, you know, trying to get something big off the ground in the industry while at the same time moving forward on my own projects. Um, and there's something I, I might shoot in Thailand next year on a, on a small scale just to be moving forward in that sense. But it depends on what happens with the other one. So, you know, tandem avenues, you know. Yes? I have another question. Why a social issue? Why make it a social issue? Why make, why make it a movie about, I don't, I don't know, about reservations? Racism and stuff. Well, well, actually, I mean, but if you saw the Scottish version, it's a guy and a girl, and they're just from different backgrounds. And that, and to me, that's the point. Uh, the point, the social point for me about the film isn't the fact that it's on a reservation. It's why aren't we seeing all kinds of movies set on reservations? Why aren't we seeing a teen comedy? Why aren't we seeing you know, a basketball movie? Why aren't we seeing a thriller? Why aren't we seeing, we only see culturally specific movies about people returning to the reservation or how hard reservation life is. But I could have, I, without, I mean, I would have changed a bit of dialogue here and there for wherever it was set, but I could have shot that in Rio, I could have shot it in Marseille, I could have shot it, you know, so many places. Um, the reservation became a character because uh, it's, it's such an extraordinary, unique place, and the poverty is there um, that it just came through. But it's, it's yeah, I mean that's the thing. It and and it distinguishes it. It's, I mean that's the thing. If I showed it in Edinburgh, it would be seen as a social realist, another social realist British film, and yet another. So you know, really keep it fresh in the mix that way. Yeah. There's one question to wrap, wrap things up. Uh -huh. um, who's your favorite director in the mainstream, in the Hollywood and all the stuff, and your favorite director in the indie business, in the business, indie film business? Well, I, I mean, I'd say my favorite director is Kurosawa, who I think, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, I, and I think Kurosawa is the best Hollywood director. Because for me, even though he never made a film there, he was directing the best thrillers and the best westerns, even though they were samurai movies. <laughs> yeah, he was, too, he, he, was, he was a very mainstream director, but it was also the highest art director. And, and to me, that's just the ultimate mix. It, it's, and, and I think that's the thing with indie movies. For me, it's like, it's still putting in a story that moves. You know, you, you, you move through narratives, you move through time, you move through all these other things, but it's a guy and a girl who have to fix them, you know, they have a problem to solve and move the audience through with it and, and, and try and get that kind of balance going together. I think when you fuse it, it's like City of God, you know, it's an amazing movie on so many levels, but it's exciting, it's, it's tense, it's dramatic, it's all those, it, it, it's, you know, Get it, get everything, including the kitchen sink, in there, you know. <laughs> so, so. Well, but let's.